Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and we are continuing municipal series on the Cross Border Interviews, where we sit down with municipally elected leaders from across this great country to talk about themselves, their communities, and of course, their duty to serve. Today, we are heading to the Yukon Territories to sit down with the village of Teslin's mayor. I was going to say his worship, but he told me not to say that because he's humble. The mayor of Teslin... Gord Curran. Gord, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. Uh, enjoy being here. Well, let's get the first question right out of the way, Gord, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? You know, it, uh, it's interesting. I guess it's like a lot of small towns. Someone just came up and said, you should run for council. You'd be a good voice on there. I was actually relatively recent to the community. I had moved up here in 2008, and I ran in 2012 and ran as a councillor. And it was really on that person's prompting. And, you know, they felt that could be a stable voice on council, um, you know, a bit of an outside voice too. And so I ran and I said, hey, you know, why not? One one term, I get the experience. It's not an experience I had anywhere else. And I said, ah, it's a nice resume enhancer. No problem. Well, that was two count, two terms as a councillor. And now I'm on my second council, uh, second term as a mayor. And it's been a decade, and if I and hopefully I'll fulfill my term, it'll be twelve years on uh, on council. And I think a lot of people start that way. Um, just sort of did it for either whether it's one issue or whether they just want to contribute to the community, or someone says, "Hey, you'd be good on council." And so then I, I want to get I want to get to know who the mayor is. Who is Gord? So I want to start because you you mentioned something that kind of threw me there for a second because. Most municipal councillors that I've talked to did not just randomly move to their community and then two years later or four years later they decided to run. You got asked, but where did you move from and what brought you to the village? Well, I'm actually I'm a born and raised Quebecer uh, from the from the eastern townships, uh, southeast of Mont- Montreal, and uh, primarily uh, English speaking, although it's more bilingual now. And I was in New Brunswick uh, for 17 years with a short stint in Toronto. And I'd, I'd been living in New Brunswick, uh, you know, it's a couple degrees, and, and I was working for there. And my wife, at the time, was my girlfriend. Um, she was uh, She's a teacher, and she had trouble finding teaching jobs in New Brunswick. So she uh, she came up the Yukon, uh, got this job in Teslin, which we didn't know anything about. Um, and she came up and got a job up here, was up here for a year. First, first thing she told me as soon as she got off the plane was, it's beautiful up here. Um, she just said, it's stunning. And then moved this quaint little town. And uh, throughout the year, she kind of said, oh, you should move up here. And uh, things changed back home in New Brunswick, my employment. And I, you know, she's literally flying back at the end of her year. And I made the decision that I'm going back with her in the, in August. And I showed up here in uh, August 2008. And uh, frankly, didn't have any expectation. I didn't know what to expect. And I kind of came up here with a completely open mind. Knew there was a lot of First Nation presence up here. I knew it was going to be in Northern Canada. Um, I knew it was going to be a pretty remote community, although we're only two hours outside of Whitehorse. It's, you know, major hub, so it's not too bad that way. And uh, frankly, I thought I'd, you know, show up in Teslin and then find a job in Whitehorse and um, end up working for the self-governing First Nation, Teslin Clinic Council. And that was, oh wow, I worked, I worked in the executive office. That was actually my introduction to politics in the community. Um, so I played. So you was know, that your introduction to politics in general, or had yeah, you had yeah. some knowledge of politics beforehand? Politics is what everyone else runs for, not me. <laughs> I, uh, I I really have no political bone whatsoever. I mean, I think I've gotten better at it, whatever the subtleties of politics are. But this is probably uh, a lot of my uh, high school and university classmates would say, "What do you mean that guy's a mayor?" Uh, <laughs> Really had no expectation. It's, I, I think it kind of speaks to the small town. I mean, I'm in a town of 450 people. And again, I came with, you know, I grew up in a small town and, and there was some opportunity, but the opportunities were in bigger centers. And showed up here and I said, 450 people, who gets a job in a small town like that in northern Uke, in northern Canada? And I've ended up with two of the best jobs. Uh, Tez and Clean Council was an eye-opening experience. Learned a lot about First Nation issues. Learned a lot about the political... Uh, political, uh, you know, administrative versus political spheres, which has proved invaluable. I learned a lot, a lot about politics in the Yukon. And, and uh, you know, those three years were absolutely invaluable. And then 
subsequently I moved in, down the same building that I was working in to Yukon <laughs> University. And that's now my full-time job. And it's a great job. It's all about community development. And I'm in a town of 450. And that goes really to my, I think, to my nature, that community development, that, you know, trying to make your make an impact on your community. And I think that's what kind of led that person to say, hey, why don't you run for council? And at the time I was working for you, well, at the time it was Yukon College, we're now Yukon University. But and was it I a just, quick uh, yes or was it a quick no? Like I, it was, it was you a, just uh, said, I'm not the politics yeah. guy. So was it a quick yes or was there some discussion? And then a few days later, it was a yes. It was a long time ago, Chris. It was a long time <laughs> well, ago. Well, that's what I want to get I, to know, Gord. I, I, my ongoing joke with anyone who runs for council down, they told you it was only a couple of meetings a month, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I think that might have been part of the pitch. Um and at first, I mean, there is a certain aspect you go to meetings. Um, as you get pulled into more and more issues, it becomes, you know, uh, and look at my own, it becomes more and more that you get involved in, in the community from that perspective. I mean, there's lots of ways to get involved in the community, but for me, it was through being elected official. Were you surprised and at the yeah. issues that people were talking about when you got elected? Well, no, I was, I was warned by somebody, not the same person who, <laughs> They said, oh, you'll know everything you want to know about dogs, ditches, and dumps. And uh, that has proven true, except there's also a lot of other issues um, that, that uh, as we, we've gone around community well-being that have, have come up too. I mean, we kind of get tagged with all the, the sewers, the dumps, and the dogs. But in fact, municipalities are play a huge role in the heartbeat of our communities. And, and the, although we don't necessarily, especially in the smaller communities, deliver services around social well-being other than recreation, you know, we play a role. We care about it. We'll lobby the other governments for certain services for our community. And when things are not going well, we'll raise our voice. And so we have a role there. And, you know, over time, I guess what I'm saying is over time, I, you'll start learning these things. And and eventually being a two, two-term two councillor after saying I was going to only do one term turned into, well, let's run for mayor. And but even though it's a small town, it's, you know, I feel the, you feel the weight of uh, being a mayor. You feel a certain sense of responsibility. It isn't just two meetings a month. Um, there's a lot is, of other work, but it's re rewarding. Is it the same weight that you felt when you first got elected in 2012? Because I can imagine walking into that council chambers as green as you were at the time, because now you're not, let's be honest, because you're yeah. the mayor, you don't become mayor overnight, <laughs> but does the weight and responsibility still hold true from when that first time you walked into that council chambers as an elected official to tomorrow or next week when you walk into the council chambers as the mayor i think initially my no it's 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 more i think now i, I mean i always found a, a, certainly a duty a responsibility and, and and a lot of it was just trying to get an understanding of my first term you know i had a pretty i have a good sense of responsibility as it to start with and a, a good sense of i have a duty to my community so that mindset was there but you know i i certainly i think i really so you start learning that position. A lot of it was just making sure you're doing the right thing for the community and shifting your your brain when you're coming a decision, right? And trying to say, well, I'm gotta look at it from a community perspective. You know, so that's early on, that's what the thinking was. And then, you know, it's, it's odd. I, you know, a veteran sort of two-term counselor. I mean, again, it's a small community, but nonetheless, as soon as you come mayor, you start saying, oh boy. You know, not not that our, and our mayor system is not, it's a weak mayor system. We do things as a council. Well, um, you're one so, vote, right? You're one vote on yeah. council, and all you're doing is basically chairing the meeting, and you're one yeah. vote. Yeah, we gotta, you gotta do, you gotta. I think that there's three things in this act. It's yeah, running the meetings, uh, providing some leadership, uh, and being the voice of council. And I, I like it; it works well with my personal style. Um, but you know, you still feel responsibility. You're the link between your council and making sure those things do happen, and that things are done in a democratic and and people know what's going on and and you're there to support and work with your administration as mayor you're the key link and you 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 need to you know again make sure your council's getting the information they need and decisions are going to them and in a, in a in a proper way you're being transparent with the community and balancing their needs to know what's going on um assessing feedback as you need or, or uh, consultation as you need and then of course the administration is integral for us who have full-time jobs um, people who actually know what they're doing in the in the uh, in the municipal world, we can make all decisions we want at the council, but without having an administration there, a, a well functioning and 
thorough administration, it doesn't really matter. Um, You've talked about the balance and you talked about how the mayor's job and the councillor's job is part time. But let's be honest. And I, and I and I and exactly it's not part time. It's full time. You get paid part time. You go to meetings, but you are there. You are the mayor full time. If you go out to your community to an event, you are there as mayor or councillor. There is no private gourd or a private citizen councillor. It's mayor gourd, mayor or councillor gourd every single place you go in your community. How have you balanced that? Because I can imagine while you seem to be an outgoing and personal guy, you want your downtime as well. And you don't want to be mayor Gord 24, seven, seven days a week. Well, the first thing I want to correct you on is I'm actually an introvert. Hi. I <laughs> really. High. Yeah. And uh, what are and, you doing and, in municipal uh, politics, man? <laughs> well, this is a, the advantage of a small town. I do not think I would be running for uh, municipal politics in a larger town. And I see the difference, uh, you know, city Whitehorse here. They're substantially larger than any of our small communities. And I think that's the beauty of our, our small communities is, is it, it isn't seen the same. Um, so I, I, you know, for me, what do you mean by yeah, that? I, I, you're, you're much more part of the community. And I was just going to say part of what I was going to say um, is yeah, I'm the mayor, but I'm also Gord and they know I work at the university. They know I, you know, you don't lose that part of your identity. <clears throat> and in fact, some people I think go, Oh yeah, Gord, you're on council. Aren't you? Yeah. In fact, I'm the mayor. <laughs> uh you know i think people do they just treat you like a they because it's a small community everyone knows everybody um and there's certain element of you don't totally lose your identity but you do bears you have to be aware that you have that responsibility when you're in the public that you are the mayor you're wearing that hat and uh, not that i was a wild and crazy party person beforehand but you, you know you know got to make sure that you are are portraying and representing your community both within the community and outside the community in a, in a proper way and do you and, think uh, you've struck in that balance? Yeah, I think so. I mean, to to I mean, it's again, you know, in a small community. So we're not. I'm not even part time in terms of pay. It's per meeting. Um, it, oh. it does. You do. You do think about it twenty four seven as mayor. I, I think that's one of the biggest differences with as councillor. I think about certain things. As mayor, I always feel like, well. You're always sort of on in terms of my brain, thinking about things, working with my administration. Um. But it's it's a little bit more of a blend, and it's a it's it's a balancing act. It's it is tough on my family. I've got a wife and a ten year old daughter, and certainly there is time away from her and at both of, or both of them, and uh, you know, and and there's work on weekends and and nights for sure. Um, so you, you know, it sometimes you don't strike that balance real well. I mean, this year we had a a flood here. Uh, we well, we didn't have a flood. We we actually had flood mitigations. We didn't have the flood. Uh, but that was a substantial effort by our I read your letter that's on the village of Teslin's <laughs> website. And I was like, oh, good for them. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I mean, luckily for me, uh, I was supposed to go on vacation um, at the time and I canceled mine, but luckily my wife and my child went on vacation. So it was just me dealing with uh, what I had to do as a mayor in that situation. But yeah, I, I think, I think it's, it's decent for balance, but you, you know, when you, you sign up for this, you know, you're committed, you know, you're, what you're taking on. Um, it is not the same. I think the visibility and the amount of effort is not the same as some of the larger centers. Like I look at the city of Whitehorse and they've got a full-time mayor, the only full-time politi full municipal politician in the Yukon. They've got a part-time council. And I think for sure, I, I think they've got a part-time job somewhere and a full-time council role that, that they're paid part-time. I, I look at the responsibilities and the obligations they, they take on. They're, they're substantially more than I would in a small community. It's just knowing when you got that hat on and and when you got to step up and do what you do as a mayor. I'm, I also benefit that uh, you know I'm a small community. It's a blended community, First Nation and uh, First Nation and non-First Nation, and we have Village Teslin and and Teslin Clinic Council, the self-governing First Nation, have an excellent working relationship. They're also much larger than us, and we're on their traditional territory, and we have land claims up here, and Teslin Clinic Council's got a huge amount of influence, so. In terms of high profile leadership in the community, the chief, the Nahashada Hani, has has a much more high profile job. So for me, it's I'm there. I've definitely got a role, but uh, you know, the First Nation takes on a lot of that leadership too. And and certainly, I, the, the the chief's job is dramatically different than my role. So you've opened Pandora's box, and I want to play in it for a little bit, if you don't mind here, because sure. I want to start with the idea that. 
you, your community of about 500 people, I think you said 450, Four, 450, yeah. 450. Yeah. Um, how important is it for a small village like Teslin to have a strong council who works well together to move the village forward in a, a positive uh, atmosphere? Because I can imagine in a small town, if there's conflicting voices or conflicting personalities on council, it can be a challenge when you are such a small community because everyone knows what everything, everything's happening in your community. Yeah. And it's a balancing act for sure. I got to say, uh, I've come to the conclusion there's nothing worse than a council that agrees on everything. What? I, really? I, yeah. I, I just... And we do agree on everything. It's the it's the diversity it's a diversity of voices, and it's the way you know, because um, we're a small council and we're you know we're a small council. We're five people, but we are in a small community. There's a lot of informality that comes with it. But I found a diversity of voices. I mean, and we always talk about that, but really, that's what you need on council. My first role as mayor is to sort of make sure that I'm ba- providing some balance to the various voices. And, and some of the people are really quiet. Some people are really, you know, verbose. Um, and I got to balance all those views. And uh, this particular council that we're with right now, actually all the councils I've been on are really good, different perspectives, but this council, they're a little bit more outspoken, but they, they're very good at working together, even if they have views that are different. Um, it, it does come down with the territory to, in a small community. We all have to work together at some level. So even if you disagree with someone today, you may not disagree with them two days from now or two weeks or two months. And so that kind of helps things along. And my role is to make sure that we I kind of center the group. I keep them grounded on the decision and make sure that things don't get too far off. And uh, and it's been a it's it's been one of the f- huge factors uh, for I think our success as a small council. But I extend it. In a small town with a self-governing First Nation, the key to our success is having a good relationship with the self-governing First Nation. It's you just stole key. my second question. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I, th- I figured you were heading there, but I, it's. Uh, I gotta say, I, I mean, uh, I'll say this with it, no substantiated proof, but I think we've got one of the best working relationships between a self-governing First Nation and a municipality. I know we're small, but it's uh, it's something that's developed. Even even in my time here, they didn't always get along. And I'm not saying I took credit. There was a lot of hard work by some other, my predecessors on both councils um, to get us to a point where it's not if if we're going to work, it's not when we're going to work there. It's not if, it's just we're going to work together on certain things. Now, you're it's, not the only village in Canada, and I say this uh, not knowing complete uh, ideas, uh, everything that's happening across Canada, but I'm going to assume that uh, the village of Teslin is not unique in the fact that it is in a uh, working relationship with a First Nations uh, community. There are other communities like that. But you said something that I want to pick up on and g- pick your brain a bit, a, a little bit. What makes a good relationship for a mayor and a chief to get along to uh, best build bridges and work together for the best of everyone in both communities? You know, you got to have a shared understanding of, of on certain things you're here for the entire community and knowing the, the big thing is going to know the di- organizations are different and some of the goals are different. You know, so the self government first station has different goals and serve different people, but within our municipality, we serve some of the same people. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's not a, he, he, he them or us, it's us together. Um, but you got to know the organizations are different. The goals are different. Um, they've got different issues they're, they're doing. Um, you know, so that starts with that, but it's also a certain degree of trust. And uh, But you always ground it in the issue and and saying, what's the best for the community? You know, it's certainly for the municipality, there's certain things that are better for the municipality and certain things that are better for TTC. But when certain issues that are a common concern, we'll go, is this the best thing for the community? And certainly we've taken the stance on the, you know, uh, a rising tide, you know, lifts all boats. And so sometimes in the, the, the support takes different forms. It sometimes is a letter of support. Sometimes it's a partnership on certain approaches. And we, you know, there's, we, that's the other thing you got to know is there's some flexibility. It's, and you got to have the option to say no and, and provide your reasons for saying no on certain things too. And we've gotten that kind of trust on a personal level. You just, you just got to be able to, sit down and have a coffee or a tea or something with somebody. How often treat- as mayor are you working with the uh, TTC? 
as mayor uh well um as mayor okay because i'm in the building well like, that's what I, <laughs> that's why i wanted to preface that yeah. with mayor because um, i can imagine you're working with them at all times but as mayor how often do you as mayor as the head of council have to deal with the ttc so we meet qu quarterly as two councils uh, okay we, wow we do okay meet quarterly um so that's a formal more formal it's still informal because we're all community members um but i mean i, I can you know that sometimes like you can call the chief up tomorrow and say okay we have an issue I, let's talk about it he and i will text everyone's phone we don't text he's very busy and it's but it's we know i know i can pick up the phone and he'd answer my phone call he knows he can call me and i'd answer his call wow. and uh i mean that's i mean eric morris the current nahasha to henny and i have a long relationship he was the chief i mean he's gone in and out of leadership but he was a chief when i started working for tesla clean council so that started there of course, he didn't know I was going to become the mayor, and I didn't know he was going to be a chief again. Um, but I mean, we had worked on other boards and everything, so there's a personal relationship there, and and uh, there's a, a there's, you know a large degree of trust. We see our relationship the same. We understand there's differences. We appreciate some of the differences or a lot of the differences. Um, and so there's a personal relationship, and you know, in my time, the chiefs have come and gone, and there's always a certain amount of of uh, it may not a be as quite a deep relationship as I have with Eric currently, but there's always an ability to go up and talk to a chief. Uh, it's a small town and and talk about issues and, and keep it grounded on, you know, trying to understand where TTC might be coming from and understanding where the village is coming from and, and seeking that common ground. So I want to turn to segment two here, and I want to preface this question, this question with the, the following statement, but I think yes. in the, Oh, can Hello? I stop you for that? I just want to go back. I just want to go back. I said there's okay. unsubstantiated proof that this is one of the strongest relationships. Okay. Uh, uh, but there actually is three three things that I'll point to that are 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 indications of a strong working relationship and good uh, social capital. Um, we're the only community in the Yukon with a joint community development plan. We're the only community that has a joint recreation uh, program. Uh, TTC and and Village of Tesson, uh co-fund the programmer and thirdly uh we're the only community with a joint community uh, joint emergency measures plan although legislatively it has no power because the municipal this the uh emergency measures act is from the 50s doesn't even acknowledge the existence of self-governing first nations so we've gone ahead but those are three things i just want to say i said i've substantiated but those are three things that show that it's not and we've got to have several mous and different agreements but those are the three things that are long-standing how often do you update those? Is that something so, that are they a, sort of a living documents or are they yeah. uh, sort of just okay? Like you said, they were in the 1950s and they're still today. Yeah. <laughs> so I gotta say, I mean, the other fourth document is our, our official community plan, which every municipality has or most municipalities have. That remains a municipal document, but in there we've respected the fact that TTC TTC has about 20 percent of their lands is is within our municipality. And uh, how within big there, is we, your municipality? Uh, I can't remember. For 550, very small. for 450 people, 450 I can't, people. Ima can't imagine well, being that is, large. Well, this is the problem. Our boundary is really small, and we actually serve people just outside our boundary, like a lot of places. But it, there's actually the, the, the sense of Teslin as a community is larger than our municipal boundary. And we're actually, that's one of the things we're working on is municipal boundary expansion. Well, that's but, what I was going to talk about in the next segment, yeah. because on your well, website, boundary, and I was like, what, what, yeah. like, what's that all let's, about? So let's, let's, sit, but I just want to finish up the OCP. Uh, we've got embedded in there. The fact that we have settlement land and reserve, uh, retain reserves. Uh, TTC has those within our boundary, 20%. Our bylaws uh, only exist on those properties are applied as TTC wishes. Um, and when we develop the OCP, and every, it's about every ten years, we have to do the OCP um, and the and the zoning bylaw. Um, although it's ultimately up to VOT to approve, um, TTC's there as a co-planning it because they play a big role, even if it's not on their land. It's the it's a community approach to it. So they're there as a partner in all that. And so there's four things. And the other things that you're talking about, you started with. So the com joint community development plan is updated regularly. Uh, so we got charts in there around our infrastructure projects that are coming up. Uh, so we try to do those uh, annually. It sort of fell off during the pandemic for obvious reasons. Um, 
but those are updated annually and about every five years we go and try to make sure that the community is okay with the, the plan itself the plan itself has a whole bunch of values and what the community wants to see and everything like that and we've actually drawn on that joint community development plan and inserted aspects into our ocp to make sure that they're parallel so when you say you uh, uh go out and get feedback are you holding public hearings are you going door knocking like what like what community buy-in are you trying to get uh, from your community when you're trying to update these or is it just you're getting community buy-in by your elected officials from your counselors from your mlas from your mp yeah it's the ocp is a defined process yeah so that's different it includes a, a hearing a public meetings but also hearing the joint community development plan because there is no actually legal it's a it's a, just a planning document for us yeah. our, our organizations we we would go out we'd actually update it and present it to the public every april we so typical yukon fashion we'd have a great big steak and chicken dinner uh steak, steak and chicken barbecue every april and I, i'm just both, marking that down for my travels to the yeah. yukon <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to get back on track. We haven't had it for three years because of, and we're, we haven't talked about it this year. We're trying to get back everything back on track, but usually it's at different levels. Sometimes it's, if we roll into fuller deep dive in our projects and, and everything, we'd have a, a much more expanded uh, process leading up to the barbecue. And then we present everything. Sometimes we just give everyone an update say, this is what we've done. And that was one of the promises we made in that document. We said, we're going to update you every year on this. It's unfortunately fallen off a little bit just because of the pandemic, and we're hoping to get that back on track, but that's part of the joint reporting back, and it takes different forms. And that's a nice thing because it's not a legislative document that we can decide what's best. Do we do we want input on these projects? Do we want to reevaluate our our priorities? Do we want to make sure the values are still standing, you know, still still what uh, the, reflects the community? Things like that. It's it's actually I, I gotta say it's one of the more dynamic. I like our OCP process and our zoning bylaw, but I gotta say the joint community development plan is where because it's used every year. Uh, and I'll give you an example. We had uh, Doug Griffiths up here, another municipal voice. I, I know Doug quite well. He's been yeah. on the show. <laughs> well, we had him up here a few years ago. It's now about six or seven years ago now, or maybe longer. My memory's starting to go. Um, and uh, he was talking about the associate uh, this joint community development plan because. Oh, and we had the administrative council doing, a, we had a joint meeting together and he said, so how often do you use this plan? And all the administrators on both sides put up their hand. Like they said, how do many people use this plan on a daily basis? And all the administrators put up their hand. They, it's the, it's usually the infrastructure projects that drive it, but it's a huge, the, the values and everything else that's in there guide a whole bunch of things. It's uh, the municipal Bible in some sense. Yeah, it's and it was. Well, it's, it's not just for us. It's it's TTC and ourselves, but it's the community, maybe community yeah. Bible, community, you know, expression of of this is who we are, at least in that context. Um, and I think the community is is uh, they like it when we work together. Oh, it, uh, they they see the they see the positive results. Anyways, so what, I, I cut you off. We're moving on to the next part. No, <laughs> no. Hey, I like I love these conversations where it's a free flow of ideas, and we I I, I yeah. can I get more out of the, these conversations than a, the traditional structured interviews. But I want to go to the second segment now because I am cautious of time because you are a mayor yeah. and you're quite busy. Um, I want to talk about the village as a whole. And before I start this question, I want to preface it by saying this is an opinion of the mayor. This is not a direction of council. This is not a motion at council. This is his yeah. opinion. We get a lot of random emails from people yelling at me for asking this question. <laughs> so, uh, Gord, in your opinion, I'm prefacing that with a loud, yeah. in your opinion, what what do you believe is the biggest issue facing your village today? Oh, you want one issue. <laughs> or what are the top three, yeah. top five issues that are facing your community today? You know, I think right now is financial stability. Um um, you know, we're, we're well run. We're not for anyone from Tesla listing. We're not going bankrupt or anything, but you know, we're, this council has been really good about looking towards the future. Um, we've got a small tax base, um, you know, st staffing's an issue. We're, uh, wage wise, we're, we're falling farther and farther behind the first self-governing first nation, which is, we're always going to be a little behind. They're a much bigger organization. Uh, I think their budget was 20 million. Ours is like four. Um, and then from there, the Yukon government also drives some of those wages. So we're falling farther and farther behind on wages, which affects our staff recruitment and retention, um, which is a problem. Uh, so far, we've got our dedicated staff, but we do know 
we need to start addressing that. Um, growing demand for services. Um, I think that's just happening across uh, the country, uh, especially as we evolve. We're just and and on top of that, you know, the Yukon government's evolving as well. They continue to evolve. They're they're still a relatively young government. I mean, self government even in a ter- territorial context is fairly recent. And we, new we, premier we, now too. So a new premier, <laughs> yeah. And 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 you know, every time they do something and it affects municipalities, whether it's directly or indirectly, it's it's more work for our staff. So that's our the obligations there on top of the services. Um, you know, solid waste and recycling. Um, we live in a consumer society and the municipalities are the ones that deal with it. I'm sure you've heard it from others. Um, and that's becoming an issue. The recycling is you know, it, 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 it's a problem. It's 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 hitting the wrong end. You want to get, you want to stop stuff ending at your recycling. And same with your solid and and by extension your solid waste, right? Um, so there's that's a it's a bit of lobbying more than anything else. But you're also dealing. It goes back to our staffing. We actually need more staff to work at our, our waste solid waste transfer station. Um, big one. You probably, you know, uh, one of the other things. Sorry, is uh, water delivery and production. We have got water. But we're starting to here in town. We're starting to hit our, our max. I mean, the community continues to grow a little bit. Uh, we still need more housing, and so that's going to put a more demand on services and more demand on our water. Water is good, but we're we got to look at that, and 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 that leads into my next thing, which is keeping infrastructure up to date. So whether it's the water increasing our demand for our water treatment plant and and our distribution right now, it's all all by truck. Um, so that you know, and then we got all the other infrastructure. And I think that's a com- probably a common thing you've heard from every every elected official around infrastructure. It is just not cheap. <laughs> infrastructure and waste and recycling are the uh, top I, two I concerns know. across this country. I don't know what's going on in Canada. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, and you know, on the well-being side. So those are typical municipal things that we talk about the the dogs, ditches, and dumps that we always talk about, but. You know, community well-being is a big issue for us. We have a, a drug crisis up here. Mental health, I say, is a huge issue. Not just because of the darkness, but I think they're related. Uh, they're not the dark, but the drugs and the mental health. And, and I think that's just, it, it, it's becoming more and more a prominent issue. And uh, and it's, and we're seeing that across Canada. We're starting to dig, dig deeper and realize it's not just about throwing a bunch of people in jail. Um, I mean, that plays a role as well, but... It's much more uh, more than that, and although we don't deliver services in in those areas, it is still a concern. It affects or impacts our community. And the other thing we're always, you know, is economic diversity. Is how do you continue to even our small economy here? How do you, you know, our best way we've done economic diversity is managing our own projects, our own infrastructure projects, roads, lift stations. Um, we're one of the few Yukon communities that does that, but it's a way to splinter projects into such a form that our small businesses can benefit from them and and you know another thing that i think is coming up is tourism uh we'll talk about that a little later but you know tourism is we got we're, we're right on alaska highway <laughs> right oh there. yeah and i'm prob- excited for that drive probably- i you have no idea how excited <laughs> i am for that drive with my rv this summer <laughs> yeah. so there's an i think there's an untapped opportunity there so those are the things that you know you talk about it um, those are some of the things that, uh, you know, are small community, but, you know, probably a lot of the similar things you hear from larger communities as well. And we still got to deal with it and we got to deal with a much smaller staff and a council that is, is not even part-time. So it, it, it ends up being big. So I'm going to ask the million dollar question here. Um, everything you've mentioned, whether it be water delivery, aging infrastructure, staffing, retention, uh, whether it be, uh, community well-being, economic development, it all comes down to one thing. And you're right. You are a small community and you can't get blood from a stone. As much as you try, you can't. It comes down to money. How much do you have to yell, scream, kick to get the attention from other governments, whether it be provincial or federal, to get better funding for communities your size because you look across your uh, territory and I I can imagine you're the second person I've spoken to from the Yukon so I'm I'm generalizing here I guarantee you money would be an issue in every single community that I speak to in the Yukon how yeah. do you as mayor address this and not do it on the backs of the 
citizens while telling the province that we need help because we're, we're, we're drowning here. Yeah. There's a couple of levers for us. So first of all, be, be straight. The infrastructure dollars, those are usually federal dollars that you probably flow through the Yukon government through ICIP. Uh, yeah. Oh my gosh. Which is no longer the ICIP fund. They've changed it. Just remarketing. They, they change it every uh, month. I, it I seems know, like. <laughs> ICIP for those that are in the know. And if you don't look it up, um, but I mean, you know, the concern there is if, you know, that we've heard indications might change that. And that's a problem for us. There's no, absolutely no way we can, I mean, there's just, we just don't have the tax base to do even a million dollar project. And I can guarantee you that infrastructure projects don't even start at a million. It's much higher than that. So that's that's a huge thing. So we do lobby and through Association of Yukon Communities, they're one of our, our biggest helps on that in terms of advocating the Yukon government, but they also have a... a you know, they have a direct connection to Federation of Canadian Municipalities, which lobbies the federal government. And that I've been at that table when I was president of the Association of Yukon Communities. And, you know, they FCM plays a big role in, in, in stuff we really can't do, which is lobbying the federal government directly. Otherwise, we're leaving it up to territorial government um, and no disrespect to them. They do what they need, but they're also balancing their own needs um and and small municipalities may not you know they do do advocate for us but it's better if we can do it directly to the feds through fcm and fcm's doing a great job paying attention to northern needs and infrastructure keeps popping up again and again and again so you know those what, uh is there a is there a red line that you can't cross right now when it comes to the aging infrastructure issue because i can imagine the the longer the issue waits the worse the issue gets the longer you wait the older the pipes get the older the yeah. roads get so how what's the red line that you have to say okay guys if we don't get this done right. by 2025 this is going to be a lot bigger issue and it's going to be a lot more money so we're lucky here we started we implemented asset management about a decade ago in our small community with TTC. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. And it goes, remember infrastructure projects, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and part of that was, you know, that was part of that to actually not entirely related, but certainly um, we've, we've worked really hard to try to update our, 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 our infrastructure. And right now, like some of the sewer lines we're we're trying we're probably gonna do some work to them and upgrade them. Um, but yeah, I mean the water treatment plant's about ten, a decade old, but we're we're realizing we're probably going to outgrow it in about five years. Um, so the nice thing with asset management and paying close attention to, you know, like this one is water usage. Where's the town? If the town is growing, TTC, and this is the, communi the value of communication with TTC. They're planning a major subdivision. They're planning a new administration building. So the water needs are going to go up. They haven't done those things. So now we're going. All right, what do we need to do? Uh, and so we're starting to plan ahead. So I can't give you a sort of a red line. This is what's going to happen. I can tell you, due to good planning, we have a pretty good idea of what's coming down the pipe, literally <laughs> down or up. Um, but we do know what's, uh, you know, we have a fairly good idea what's coming up, but there's no red line. Like we're going to shut off your water. There's no red line. Like we're going to, this is going to just fail because we've tried to avoid that uh, as much as we can, but the, the needs are increasing. So there's no red line, but, it's all through planning. It's all through that asset management. I can't tell you how valuable that's been as a budgeting tool and a planning tool and, so and far into the future. You've given me about 10 issues that you believe are facing your community. Now, if I go talk to 20 people in the village of Teslin tomorrow and I ask them that exact same question, what is the biggest issue? They will all tell me their unique issue. There might be some overarching, whether it be healthcare, whether it be highways or but infrastructure or water. But they'll have their, my pothole in front of my house. I need a park. I need recreation. Yeah. How do you balance what your community needs against what the village needs? Because an individual resident will believe their issue is the most important to you. And they believe that they should get it fixed tomorrow and not have to wait till next year's budget cycle. How do you balance that? Well, you, you hope the issue is another level of government. That's the first thing. <laughs> That's always the reason you start. Those are lovely. We can't deal with that. Uh, but to your point. Um, I'm sorry. That's I, the best answer I've gotten from yeah. these interviews ever, Gord. Yeah. I, I mean, you got to listen to what's going on. And you got to, I always try to investigate what's going on. One, is it is it our responsibility, whatever it is? Um, and sometimes you think it is, and then you realize it isn't. Uh, sometimes we have partial responsibility. 
you know, because we do a lot of, uh, we're pretty good, strong in the planning for a small community. You should have a pretty good idea what is possible. Um, and and then it's, it's reporting back and saying, here, we're going to do this. And sometimes it's the disappointing stuff is usually if it's something that's pipe water, great example. So, or uh, pipe water and, uh, and the subdivision I live in, sewer. Uh, so we don't have any force sewer main up in my subdivision. Um, it's slowly turning from rural residential into the residential. Um, but, you know, I've had a couple of my neighbors say, you know, what, a, you know, what about it? And I'm going, well, it's, it's a $20 million expenditure. It's on that where we've started talking about it, but I need to manage your expectations that it's not going to happen tomorrow. We're aware of the issue. And a lot of times we are aware of an issue and we have to uh, provide them an answer. But there's also going to be some understanding is municipalities don't always pivot on a dime. I mean, certainly if it's a service related, that one we can resolve pretty quickly or, you know, figure out what the, the, the under, sometimes it's an underlying issue. So, but you're right. The issues the community asked for will be different. I, I got a really gem, a gem of an issue I'm going to provide to you though. So getting back to our joint community development planning, the top ask in 2015 was a swimming pool. They want, we had a swimming pool years ago and it got old and they, they did away with it with the council of the day. And this is this is a long time ago. Um, I said, we're, we're going to give you, a, we're going to build a new swimming pool. Well, that swimming pool has not appeared yet. And when we did our community consultation in 2015, the by far swimming pool was the number one thing the community wanted. So we went in and uh, we looked at it and we realized, so we could probably find funding to build the building. Probably. Good chance, although you have to balance out, are you, you want to buy a swim, you want to build a swimming pool or a water treatment plant? You know, you go with the water treatment plant, that one, right? And no, they're not the same. Um, they deal with water, but different. Um, but, you know, in the end of the day, we looked at, we probably, if we looked at it, we could probably find money for it. Um, but how are we going to manage it? Because we, early estimates, we are probably at $100,000 a year. And probably when you talk as staffing, because we would have to find lifeguards, we were probably going to get over 150000 There was no way we could support that. And so as a counselor at the time, our responsibility was to make sure, you know, I know we hear you, community, you want this, but the municipality can't take it on. Um, it's, it's, we cannot, I, we don't know how we're going to pay for it. We're already financially, we're well managed. We just can't, you know, we can't add a hundred thousand dollars to our budget we got to find the money so it's either a fee which frankly even if you charge a fee it probably wouldn't be able to cost recover everything um or it's raising taxes which is always popular subject and i don't think we could have realistically raised the taxes enough to support that um so in the end of the day it's still on the on the list ttc tesson Clean council says they probably they're looking at they got to build a new school here they may incorporate in the new school we'll see you know, at the end of the day, yeah, sometimes the community comes and say, we want this, but the financial viability of it always has to be it has to be a part of the equation. And, and we have a, an obligation to future councils not to bind them. Um, at the same time, you got to make sure you don't, you know, the answer, the easy answer is sometimes is always no. Uh, sometimes you got to take that leap and you got to say, we got to, we got to dream big on this one, but the swimming pool was not one of those. Okay. Now I, I am got I am cautious of time here and yeah. I, I know I said 45 minutes and we're at the 45 minute mark yeah. here. Do you have 10 minutes? Sure. But, okay. Because I want to ask about this boundary issue because, yeah. uh, and then we'll turn right to tourism after this, uh, this, com this, uh, this little segment, um, the village of Tesla's growing, or are you wanting to re draw the lines of the village to incorporate communities outside of the village if that makes sense just take me through the process of this yeah. teslin boundary expansion that is on your website so it's both actually um so within our current boundary we have no developable land okay we're at our max we also have people so, so there's no nearby communities we're incorporating uh, like formal communities or anything but we also have communities that are just outside small subdivisions that have been built subsequent to the last time the boundary was as was was uh was drawn um that are now in existence and get services from us at, at very near the cost of what is within the boundary 
uh, they they do they are TTC subdivisions mostly. Uh, there are a few others that are not TTC lands, but it does incorporate a lot of their subdivision. And then TTC is also planning this other subdivision I refer, reference to, and they're going to want services. So we'd like them in the boundary because um, they are Tesla considered Tesla, but they're getting services that are right now the pricing is fairly equivalent. And so our taxpayers are playing, paying the burden of those services. So um, so we want to straighten out the boundary. We do have a, a bit of a weird, we could do a small adjustment. We have one where the boundary goes right through somebody's house. Uh, we have another one where if you're on one side of the street, you're in the boundary, you're on the other, you're not. Um, you know, we've got some anomalies that way, but really the biggest driver on that is is the fact we've got these communities that these resident, not these uh, subdivisions that were built that are getting services, but not within our boundary. And then we, we're expecting more of those to appear because within our boundary, we we don't have any more land to develop. Is the TTC uh, willing to sit down with you and talk about this? Because I can imagine, and this is just me, the assumption kicking in again, and I know you should never assume because it makes it something out of you yeah. and me. Yeah. Um, is are they willing to come to the table and have that discussion with you? So we've been discussing it now. We, we, we've we been discussing it for 20 years, um, but even in the last year or so, we've been really discussing a lot of earnest um, and including uh, doing, uh, we've done a couple of studies in the past five years on the financial implications. Um, right now we had a meeting, we had a joint meeting in January and, and there's some concerns around the sovereignty, uh, which I appreciate. I mean, uh, you got another level of government potentially telling you how to deliver services. That doesn't, I appreciate why you, you want to think about that. Think twice about that. So that's, those are some of the big, so to answer your question, yeah, they're, they're definitely open to it. They understand we service a, 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 the larger community. They appreciate the services we, we offer and the efficiency of it. Um, but yeah, they've got to balance some of their larger issues, which is sovereignty, the taxation too. Um, they have an ability to tax and what happens when we're in there. Um, so there's some things to still sort out. Uh, we're definitely, you know, in principle, I think we're we're in agreement of something. Uh, we're not sure if it's going to turn out to be a boundary expansion or it could be just a municipal service agreement. We've been delivering services to this adjacent subdivision without a municipal services agreement for 20 years. That, that's what speaks- friends do for each other, though. Well, I think it speaks well to the working relationship, but unfortunately we've been very firm uh, yeah. saying, you know, financially this is not working anymore for us and probably didn't work 10 years ago, but you know, there, there's give and take, right? And, but right now we're, we're looking, this, this council is particularly looking beyond this term and saying, we really need to start addressing these things um, for the long-term health of, of the, the municipality, but not the municipality, but for the community. Well, I want to turn to our last segment here because we have five minutes left before I have to let you go. And that is tourism, 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 tourism. I love tourism because I believe it's something that a lot of municipalities need to address more often because it is a big economic driver. So as I said in our uh, earlier in the interview, I'm coming through your community this summer. What should I be stopping to see? And what should the people who are listening to this be stopping to see and visit while in uh, coming through the village of Teslin? So we have three museums. We have the George Johnson Museum, a small nonprofit. We have the Wildlife Museum, which is attached to the Yukon Motel, which is our largest business in in the community and well worth a meal when you come through and some gas. And we have the TTC Heritage Center, which is, uh, again, another worthy visit, just three kilometers outside the village. And so those are the big attractions in terms of people coming through, but we're also adjacent to the Yukon's largest lake. Is that it right um, behind you in that photo? That, yeah, that's it. Um, <laughs> and um, and it's just beautiful up here. So we we have worked on, on our trail network so that you can walk through the community. It's still a work in progress, but it's one of the things that Miss Pally decided we could start enhancing a little bit more, partly for uh, just community travel, community members, but also for the tourists. Um, and you, just outside of town where that photo was taken, you could walk up to the microwave tower and get an outstanding view of uh, of the traditional territory of Tessin Clean Council. Um, so there's that. But I got to say with tourism, uh, just to be, be clear, Miss Pally doesn't have an economic arm and we're pretty limited on what we can do. But I do know Tessin Clean Council, they've 
been working on a tourism strategy before the pandemic. It unfortunately got stalled out uh, for various reasons. Um, but part of that discussion is, is what about this traffic coming up? Is there a way we can keep people a couple of days? Uh, we're not probably not a destination, but we're more of a nice stop along the way. Enjoy your stay. It's got, we've got lots of natural environment, natural assets. Well, you've got me there for at least a day yeah. because you said three museums and I went, yeah. okay, I'm, I'm there for a few days. <laughs> yeah. Um, no swimming pool. Um, there's a lake behind you. I can, I can go lake. jump in the lake. I'm I'm yeah. from Ontario. I I swam in gr gr the Great Lake. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you can't. My my just small story. My my daughter, ten year old daughter, swims in the lake, and uh, she's used to it. Like she's in there almost like the minute the ice is off. She went to the pool this winter in Whitehorse, and she goes, "It's too hot." So, <laughs> uh, anyways. Um, but it, it's something that, you know, TTC, to their credit, has realized they've got lots of natural assets. So they're, about, they're obviously it's traditional territory, so they've, they're, it's more expansive. And there's probably untapped tourist, coming, untapped tourist dollars coming up that could be diverted in the community. So it's an ongoing conversation, uh, but we're not quite there. And tourism is going to increase. It has been increasing. It's going to increase. Well, it did increase until the pandemic. And uh, you're going to have to manage it somehow. And we've got these natural assets, the lake, the mountains uh, trails people are going to want to use those and you got to figure out how you want it to, how that you want it used that's your opportunity what about yourself though after a stressful council meeting as after a stressful day at work where do you go to decompress in the community and now i'm going to preface this because i know you're an introvert and every other yeah. counselor that i've spoken to has said the exact same thing and i've told them they can't anymore yeah. you can't say your house so where in the community do you go to decompress and just relax. Is there a park? Is there a walking trail that you get to that you can just go and just reconnect with yourself? Well, first of all, you're assuming there's stressful council meetings. Um, <laughs> our, our meetings are actually quite civil. Uh, and actually, with the list of I issues that are going on in your <laughs> no, community, I, I'm I assuming they're we, not stressful. We, we've got to, I mean, they're stressful issues for sure. They're big issues, right? But our council, we tend to have those conversations and they're on the whole, they're pretty good. Um, that's not a dodge on your question. Um, I gotta say when you're minus 40, you're going home, man. <laughs> I mean, you're going home. I mean, okay, I'm I'll, going, I'll, I'll to, let you have that one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, other than that, no, I, I seriously, I, unfortunately, I can't give you anything else. It's usually trying to get home. Um, cause it's, it's, you know, our, our meetings are at night after work and, uh, I've got a family and, uh, they usually want to see me. Thank God they still want to see me. Um, and, uh, so, I mean, yeah, unfortunately I can't get too, uh, I can't say anything else. I do know one of my counselors, they tend to go for a late night walk and, but that's a, that's a daily thing that she does. Um, and, and a few others will go home and watch the hockey game in the middle of winter and, uh, have a, have a, have a water or two. So I guess my last question here for you, uh, Gord, I was going to call you your worship again. I almost got through a whole interview with it, yeah. calling someone your worship. But um, in your opinion, what makes the village of Teslin such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? You know, it's um, it's a beautiful place to live. I mean, that was quite apparent. You can see the picture in the back. I didn't realize I was marketing my own my own home. Um but I mean, there's that. Um, it's beautiful in terms of uh, you know, it's there's something to be said to work, have that close work, working relationship with the Tezen Klingit people and the government and the people themselves. It brings a vibrancy to the community and uh, a uniqueness to the community that I don't think you can find other places. And it, it, the community is. We always have our differences and things that you know always have trouble, but the community always comes together. And, uh, and we saw that during the pandemic. They uh, it was remarkable. To see, um, to see how they came together and just worked together and uh, took care of each other, and so that you know, in terms of living here, that's uh, it's absolutely remarkable. I mean, it doesn't always go great, but you know, in the end of the day, it all we always figure it out, and uh, it's one of those resilient thing, resiliency things that I've uh, clued in since I moved up here. I always said, ah, oh, it's never gonna, it's all gonna fall apart, but for some reason they always, the community members always figure it out, whatever the challenge is. The flood is a great example. Gord, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down for the last almost hour now and chatting about your community. Um, 
your community is well served with you at the head of the council and we need more people like you who are personable but also a big eye introvert who does not seem that way on camera or via audio um so thank you so much for doing this and i i look forward to a meeting you hopefully when i'm coming through yeah. the village of teslin and b uh visiting your community because you've painted such a vibrant picture of it and i'm looking forward to seeing it in person yeah, well, please stop by when you're coming up this way. Look me up and or send me an email before you get here or when you get here, however you want to do it. But uh, certainly wouldn't mind showing you around the community. Awesome. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media. Go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, help our, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. <laughs>